Welcome to Hedge Fund Tips with Tom Hayes. I'm Tom Hayes, and this is your 216th video cast podcast for the week ending December 7th, 2023. Uh, wanna quickly do the media, wanna thank Nicole Petalides, Caitlin Christ, Heidi Schultz, and Megan Graylish for having me on Schwab Network live at the New York Stock Exchange this week. Uh, was a great segment, and we'll give you some overview as well as some picks, so we're gonna listen in here. In the meantime, let's keep that conversation going on the markets and things you should be following. Thomas J. Hayes is with us, Chairman Managing Member at Great Hill Capital. Thank you so much, Thomas, for being with us. Thanks for having me, Nicole. So, what a November this was, huh? Yeah, I mean, second best since 1980. Uh, and what's interesting is in October, uh, equity investors dumped $16 billion of equities right before you had the November rally. Mm. So I think as we as we go into December here, I want to be long Santa and short the Grinch uh, with qualification, of course. Uh, and that qualification is historically since 1950, the first two weeks of December tend to be flattish or a little choppy. We're seeing a little bit of that, that today, except in small caps. Uh, and then Santa comes to town the second two weeks of December on average. So, you know, it just shows you, you shouldn't be timing the market because, right. you know, you, you mentioned how in October you saw 16 billion in outflows and those people missed. They missed a, an incredible run or rally. Um, you do see a pop then coming. Santa Claus rally, is that what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, how yeah. does that work? Because we often talk about the Santa Claus rally and then we talk about, um, you know, the January effect. We talk about the, the Santa Claus rally going from December into January, yeah. right? What dates do you watch most closely? Well, this is the period of the year, Nicole, where actually small caps tend to dramatically outperform. So from Thanksgiving Ooh. to January 2nd, the S&P is up on average about 2.5% whereas small caps are up 3.2%. So that's where you're going to get your juice. And if you look at valuations, what's selling off the last couple of days is the, the Magnificent Seven. You're seeing Microsoft, you're seeing Google, you're seeing Amazon uh, mm -hmm. give, give a little bit. The s and is trading at 18.9 times forward earnings. Mid caps are trading at 13.9 times and small caps are trading at 13.2 times. So you're seeing hmm. some bargain shopping into the holidays. Yeah, that's amazing. At this point now, when you think about I wonder if, you know, since the, the, since the Magnificent Seven are pulling back some, as you were talking, yeah. um, when they or when they pull back, is that an opportunity to well, get into some of those tech sort of names or not necessarily? I think, the, I think the major opportunity was last fall when no one wanted them, but I do think they're going to hold up fine into year end because I right. don't think you're going to see wholesale selling. Uh, people want to wait till after the new year to take any profits in those that, you know, Magnificent right. Seven on average is up 80%. Uh, so they're, they're going to be just fine. But I think on a relative value basis, you're seeing the small caps and the mid caps start to take off. You're also watching um, jobs data very closely. We're, yeah. we're watching for jobs on Friday. We'll get jolts tomorrow. Yeah. Um, your thoughts on the jobs picture and why it matters at this time? Well, the magic we've been seeing is Goldilocks, right? So we, not too hot, not too cold. We mm -hmm. want to see a jobs report uh, below 200,000 on the NFP. So a uh, little bit softer. You want to see the average hourly earnings between point, uh, two tenths and three tenths of, of 1% right. month on month. And you want to see the CPI next week, two tenths to three tenths month on month, uh, as well as finally the Fed meeting. We want to get those dot plots down to zero. We want no hikes moving forward. And if we can get those four pieces in place, you're going to see that big tail end, uh, tail end of December rally. Yeah. All right. And then you have some names here that you're watching. You have some uh, mid cap names that are in focus as well. Tell me about some of the names. Are these names that you like? So yes. Picks? Yeah. These are these are names we own. Oh, good. Uh, okay. VF Corp. Okay. Yeah. This is uh, North Face, Timberland, uh, Supreme, Vans. Vans has been the weak performer. They're down 20%, but North Face is up 19%. Uh, wholesale change. Bracken Darrell right. just came in as the new CEO. He came from Logitech. And what's interesting is VF Corp is down 85% from its pre-pandemic highs. When he came into Logitech, it was down 82%. So he's a turnaround guy. Yeah. If you put $5 million into Logitech when he became CEO, within eight years, that $5 million became $133 million, wow. a 26-bagger. Uh, we think he's going to turn around this company. He's already installed a new president for Vans. He's cutting costs. He had his kitchen sink quarter, uh, and the stock is starting to take off. So this one, we think, over the next few years can really start to be a multi-bagger. I'll tell you, that's not a theory I hear too often. It makes sense because yeah. we always say, like, when you look at stocks and you look at companies, 
always got to look at that management, and that management yeah. story is a great one. 100%. Um, and then you're looking at uh, Crown Castle, right? Yeah, well, here, here's one that's in transition. Uh, Elliott Management, Paul Singer came in with a $2 billion position and mm -hmm. a nasty activist letter last week, basically yeah. said, I'm Paul Singer. I'd like to fire you, and I'd like to fire the CEO. Uh, and by the way, how was your, how was your, how was the play? But um, leaving that aside, you've got uh, what he wants to do is basically he says your peers are dramatically outperforming you over the last handful of years. We want to sell off the small fiber business, uh, that uh, that the small cell business and the fiber business, yeah. which was a failure, and we want to uh, increase the return on invested capital for the legacy 40,000 cell phone towers. And if we can do that, since he's come in, the stock's gone from you know high 90s to 117. If he's successful with the activist campaign, we think this can work its way to 200 over the next two years as well. So this is a, another one. And REITs do extremely well when rates are coming down, which is what we're seeing right now. Right. And, you know, this was also, yes, yeah, you noted, a REIT, uh, satellites, when we thought about telecom, this was a different way to play telecom. But um, great points you've made on that. In the meantime, just the takeaway here is that this may be the time for SMID caps overall, right? Bingo. You got it exactly, Nicole. I think, I think that's where your relative value is going to be. And I think looking into 2024, small and mid that have underperformed are going to start to outperform the last shall be first and I'd also keep a close eye on emerging markets I know mm. you touched on a couple names before my segment uh, and that's because the dollar has been steadily weakening again and that's an environment where emerging market stocks start to outperform so those are the two areas I'd be focused on for 2024 all right Thomas Hayes of Great Hill Capital thank you so much for being with us Glad you were here me. and those picks as well we'll keep an eye on those names thanks And we're back. The second one I want to listen to is I uh, had a long segment on Benzinga with Money Mitch uh, and my friend Mike Lee. And you may know Mike. He uh, frequently appears on Mornings with Maria and Varney and Co. on Fox Business. I met Mike probably four years ago uh, doing, I think, I-24 News with Michelle McCary. And we hit it off uh, because he actually grew up in the town that I live with my family in Connecticut. And he's like, well, where do you live? Blah, blah, blah. He's like, whoa, you live in that house? I think I partied in your indoor pool in high school. <laughs> and uh, he's like, it was the biggest party I'd ever been to, yada, yada, yada. Long story short, uh, great dude. Uh, he plays, um, he does... Uh, mixed martial arts uh like grappling uh unbelievable and plays rugby really great guy and why i think this is a great segment number one money mitch is uh hosting it and he always does a great job everyone loves him i always get positive feedback from his interviews but two you know mike has been bearish uh more bearish and 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 has a more bearish outlook and and he's rooted in data and, and he does comprehensive work so i think it's valuable um you know, we, we've been bullish, uh, you know, since uh, 2020 uh, on balance. And um, uh, I think it's valuable to hear the other side of the argument and, you know, draw your own conclusions because he makes some salient points and it. And it's a good dialogue. And I always listen to what Mike says because he's data based. Uh, and then you'll hear kind of my outlook also for 2024 and, and how that. Uh, compares and contrasts and some political questions were in there. So I think you're going to find this very valuable. We're going to listen now. All right. Welcome, guys. Let's get into, of course, our outlook for 2024. Of course, I'm joined today by Thomas Hayes, chairman of Great Hill Capital and Michael Lee, Michael Lee Strategy. You guys are the best. So I came to the best and got the experts all together. I want to hear it from you guys, of course, from the upcoming roller coaster political landscape that we'll be having in 2024, how do you foresee governmental decisions impacting the stock market? And if, let's say, certain political developments happen, what should investors be closely monitoring for potential market effects and opportunities? I'll go to first. Let's go to Tom first. All right, Mitch. Well, thanks for having me on. And it's great to be on with my buddy, Mike Lee. 
uh, always enjoy talking with Mike and, and, and yourself, Mitch, as well. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of noise around political uh, investing. And what I've found in my years in the business is that uh, on balance, if you bet on the basis of a political view, you lose. Uh, the number one thing that needs to happen from an investing standpoint as it relates to politics is gridlock. I mean, you basically want to keep any one party from doing too much on the extremes. And the market kind of likes the inability of, of government bureaucrats to do too much to impact uh, or slow down the beautiful growth engine that American business is. So I would say uh, the biggest risk would be if any one party gets the executive, uh, the legislative and the uh, judicial uh, branch or, or actually executive uh, Congress and Senate, if you have one party that controls all three, that's an investing risk. But so long as one party has either the Senate or Congress or the executive branch on balance, it's business as usual, it's gridlock, nothing extreme happens, and the market can just uh, grow higher and uh, the American dream can be realized with politicians out of the way. Yeah, let's continue the conversation and go to Michael. Yeah, so um, right now, if you look at predicted um, the betting markets for President uh, Trump and uh, um, Trump and Biden are tied. They're both at like 40 cents uh, to be president in the next election. Um, uh, what I would say in terms of that is the surprises we got in the election in 2016 are unlikely uh, to happen again, because I, I don't think uh, the market will count out Trump uh, the way it did in, in 2016. So that explosion we got in markets is, so people didn't really have their hands around it. Um, I would disagree with Tom in that. Um, I think uh, the Republicans are going to win all three. I just I see a deteriorating consumer over the next year. Um, and when you like try to handicap this out in that you have um, the working class. So people in the you know bottom third to the bottom half of the income stratosphere are overrepresented in the electoral college. And so the consumer in the top five or 10% uh, has, has weathered the this economy and flourished dramatically, right? It's those kind of in the bottom half that have been crushed. And that's where you're seeing the shift in the polls where, um, you know, Trump lost all these Rust Belt states in very small margins, but in the polls leading up to it, he was down anywhere from five or 10 points. Now he's up you know, three to five points. And I, I mean, the factors that have led to that, uh, mostly inflation, um, it, because it's, it's, it's not, um, you know, partisans like myself uh, that decide elections, it's low propensity voters that don't really pay close attention. Like, is this going to motivate them to go out and vote for candidate A or candidate B? And I think um, it's this kind of crushing inflation that's going to make the difference uh, when Trump is on the ballot, Republicans turn out down ballots uh, in record margins, as you saw in 2020 and 2016. So I, I think they end up with all three houses, but I don't think it's as big a surprise. Uh, so, you know, I, I would say that's a net positive. But, you know, from a macro standpoint, I think I see things continuing to deteriorate over the next year. I think the government's been cooking the books and employment data. And so that um, once once those chickens come home to roost over the next six to 12 months, um, that is not only, like what's going to drive the market, what's going to drive what's driving the economy is, I believe, what will drive the presidential election and the House and the Senate. Yeah, and I, right. I would add one one quick thing on that, Mitch. If you look at like the, the boost when Trump got elected, a lot of that was in the anticipation of, of the huge uh, tax cuts that actually got done. OK, so the market was discounting the impact of a 21 percent corporate tax rate. What, what would that do to earnings? And you had that big rally. There's there's not much more skin to take off the cat at this point. Like, yes, if, if the Republicans won all, all three, um, you'd reduce regulation, you reduce bureaucracy, you'd kind of take off some of the shackles of business. But they did a tremendous amount in that four years. So uh, to Mike's point, the the positive upside surprise would 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 probably be limited versus what people think it would be as a result of that type of an outcome. Per se. Excellent. Now, of course, this all leads to a big decision that will definitely have to come from the Fed. And do you anticipate any significant shifts or pivots from the Federal Reserve's monetary policy in 2024? 
and how might these adjustments actually influence the dynamics and investor sentiment? Uh, same, same rotation. I, I would say, um, I think the market has gotten a little bit ahead of itself in terms of how many cuts they expect before next summer, you know, cuts starting in March. Uh, it's possible uh, when you look at the two year, it starts to kind of lead things in that direction. But I, I'd be more inclined to, to see at the end of the year, maybe one to three cuts and probably back half loaded versus front half loaded. Uh, we're we're uh, slightly more sanguine than Mike in the sense that, um, you know, earnings have been about 300 to 400 basis points too pessimistic going into each quarter for the last three quarters. Uh, we do think that trend is going to persist uh, and that we do think that uh, 2020 uh, four earnings are probably somewhere in the ballpark of realistic at 245, which would be 11% earnings growth. Um, so on balance, we're, we're, we're pretty constructive. And in that context, the Fed might have to do less easing than the market is already anticipating. I'll go to Michael, of course. And uh, do you expect a pivot in 24? So, yes, um, the size of that pivot is the is is the question, and I think I think if, if we don't get a pivot, it's because this recession that people like me have been predicting um, that that I thought we were going to see sometime in the uh, end of the first quarter or middle of the second quarter just hasn't arrived yet. Um, and if if it hasn't arrived yet, it's because inflation is still high, uh, earnings look pretty good. Um, I, I don't. I don't know how that happens. I think um, what's what a lot of this year's earnings growth has been has been Nvidia, um, and it's been uh, the large banks uh, being able to take trillions of deposits, park it at the Fed, and make five percent while paying the depositors nothing. So some sort, a little, little bit of window dressing on that earnings growth. But if that persists and this economy continues to slug along. Uh, the market's setting itself up for disappointment because the Fed isn't just going to cut because interest rates, I'm sorry, because inflation year over year trends closer to 2%. They're going to want to see, you know, inflation dead. And so the only way, in my opinion, they're going to cut is with material economic weakness. And so it's the market is, um, it's, it's kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't, in that the way that we get rate cuts is if this job market really starts to fall apart. And so we've seen, um, you know, particularly with the jolts and uh, with ADP today is that uh, all the prior numbers are getting revised lower. And it's the, the revisions lower are outside any sort of real statistical probability. Um, you're looking at eight, nine, 10 Sigma type events, which are basically means somebody's cooking the books. Like it's impossible for you to have downward revisions in this fashion this many months in a row. So I, I think it's, you're, you're, you're kind of, um, we're kind of in a situation where, you know, there's, I, I'd akin the uh, likelihood of a soft landing as many have described and many think is going to happen uh, as, as realistic as like seeing Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster the next time you go for a walk in the park. Like it's just, it doesn't happen. You either, you, you kill inflation with the recession or you don't. And if we don't kill inflation, rates are probably going to stay pretty high. Yeah. And I'd have to call on you guys to uh, maybe do a little bit of a grade on the job that Jerome Powell has done as chairman, uh, at least in his inflationary battle since the pandemic. What would you guys grade him? Uh, Go ahead, Mike. You can start. Oh, like uh, I, I, a total and complete failure. Um, you, you know, and it's it's the situation we're in right now uh, is much of their own doing, and like it's, you know, um, I, I'd say in dealing with the uncertainty of the pandemic, a plus, but the pivot to move away from the sort of um, th these this unprecedented aggressive policy uh, just took too long, and it created a lot of the situation we're in, and. Um, you know, buying $120 billion of bonds uh, into 2021 
uh, on a monthly basis is going to go down as one of the worst decisions because you, you should have, in my opinion, you could have started a taper in December, the month after the presidential election. So you're completely out of politics. You don't need to be involved with it. Like because of that, like you, you've thrown a permanent monkey wrench in the housing market that could take a decade to unwind, which is creating massive social strife. You did not uh, move aggressive enough in the front of inflation. And yes, you know, all inflation is transitory. It's, it's just uh, how long, <laughs> what's that transition time? Is it uh, uh, six months, is it a year or is it a decade? So, um, you know, I, I, so it's, it's, you're now in a situation of overcompensation because I think they know uh, that Powell waited too long. He waited until it was clear he's going to get reconfirmed to kind of pivot towards a tightening policy. And that's, that's created a lot of problems. And like, I'll say that's it, all this inflation isn't his fault. Like the, the second and third stimulus packages by the Congress, um, which equates to like $5 trillion that has much more, in my opinion, to do with the inflationary situation we've seen than Jerome Powell, but, um, you know, he doesn't control Congress. He controls himself. And, you know, they should have moved much more aggressively when they started. Michael, what's the grade? Do we give him an F or does he get a D? Oh, F. F for me. Tom, what do you think? F for failure there. You know, Um, I I don't know how much you guys attended the the Berkshire annual meetings, but I'm going to take a Charlie Munger and say I have nothing to add to Mike. Uh, I, I would say, uh, I, I would just say uh, one thing, I think Mike gave Powell too much credit for the uh, uh, pandemic rescue. I would assign a lot more credit to Mnuchin, who was probably one of the smartest public servants we've ever had in the history of the country. Leave it there. To hear it. Um, so there you guys see it. Uh, it looks like two Fs. So something's got to change. We'll see if it changes in 24. Let's talk about promising opportunities. Uh, for next year, right? What are some particular sectors, industries, or maybe even just type of investments that you see as promising for 2024? Let's start with Michael this time. Yeah, so we we start talking about uh, artificial intelligence and the artificial intelligence stocks. And um, obviously everybody's favorite stock is NVIDIA. You look on your screen, it looks like, I think they updated the PE to like a 60 from 120. The the, the reality is like uh, NVIDIA is gonna do close to $100 billion in revenue next year. And they're going to net close to 50. So the stock's trading somewhere between 20 and 25 times earnings. Um, and the overhang on that stock is what is the AI tech spend going to be in calendar year 2025? And so from what I understand is the hesitance in the, the hesitation, the hedge fund community to push the stock higher is they don't, they don't know, right? Because we are not in the first innings of this artificial intelligence we don't like besides nvidia no one's made any real money from ai it's only yeah it's only nvidia i've been um, saying it show me the money right show me the money because it, it isn't the underlining chips behind it but are we actually seeing revenue come to the bottom line right and, and the way i like to describe it is with, with nvidia it's like you, you look at ai as it's this big gold rush of a mountain right and NVIDIA is simply selling pickaxes right in front of um, right in front of that mountain. Um, and so the, the other problem that NVIDIA faces is when a corporation needs to buy a lot of a specific part, it can, you can't buy 100% from one vendor. So you need to have some sort of redundancy, some sort of backup uh, to fill in for them. And so the biggest beneficiaries of that are going to be AMD and Marvel Technologies. And so I, I think Marvel, because... Um, revenue opportunity for them to go from a uh, quarter percent market share out of a hundred billion dollar market to one and two percent is m- very meaningful to their top and bottom lines. Uh, so if, if they pick up a billion dollars in new revenue from chip sales for AI next year, that matters to this company because they're only doing six or seven billion dollars in total revenue. Where is uh, AMD? It's a larger company, and they'll probably pick up similar market share as we move forward, but I think this is one where uh, the buy side in the hedge fund community is wrong because everything we know about AI is exponential growth. And the gas really only got turned on with this tech spend in AI towards the end of the first quarter of this year, and we see what it's become. And so the bet on NVIDIA and why it's kind of stuck at 500 bucks is that um, we're, we're not going to see this continued exponential growth 
uh, which I would say, like, if you look at how fast we've moved in six to nine months now, think about where we'll be six to nine months from now. So to me, NVIDIA is an extraordinarily cheap stock. Um, and these other two names are going to capitalize on this, but they are a clear head and shoulder leader in the market. Um, and that, you know, it's, but it's, you're probably, it, that stock, I think, could be a stick in the mud until you have some sort of clarity into what that tech spend is going to look like in 2025. And of course, let's go to Thomas. I know that you're ready for this. Okay. Where do you see opportunities in 24? I think we're going to see a continued broadening of the participation. So, um, you know, Mike is more of a momentum. I'm more of a turnaround guy. Some people call me turnaround Tom. I, I like uh, <laughs> things that no, turn, baby. No, no one likes. You know, look, the s and is trading at 18.9 times forward. So that's kind of, you know, a lot skewed by the Magnificent Seven. Uh, mid caps are trading at 13.9 times, small caps are trading at 13.2. So on a relative basis, I want to have some exposure to uh, small and mid. Uh, one name we like as a turnaround is uh, VF Corp. They've got uh, North Face is growing 20%. Vans is contracting 20%. They're going to fix that. Um, uh, Timberland, they've got Dickies, they've got Supreme. I know Mike wears a lot of Supreme. Um, so uh, uh, here's the deal. They just brought in this guy, Bracken Darrell. Bracken Darrell came into uh, Logitech in 2013 when the stock was down 85%. Uh, if you put 5 million bucks in when he came in, uh, within eight years, you had 133 million. He had a 26 bagger. The guy knows how to fix broken, broken projects. He's just come into VF Corp. I think he's gonna turn it around. I don't think it, it'll be a 26 bagger. But I think it'll be a multi-bagger. Uh, he's brought in a new president for uh, VF Corp. He's uh, applying the EU platform. They're growing like, like gangbusters in Europe. They're going to apply those techniques into the US. Uh, and then they're going to sell off the PAX business, Jansport, East PAC. And they're going to use that to deleverage and invest in growth. Uh, he just did his kitchen sink quarter. And the stock is starting to take off from that. I think it got down to like 14 or 13. It's now 18. Uh, and I think we're going to be off to the races and this can be something exciting. One I think I talked about with you a year ago when it was five bucks is a, a auto supplier called Cooper Standard uh, that had refinancing risk at 550. It's now 17. We think it's just getting started. We think if car production gets to 85 percent of where it was in 2017 when it was one hundred forty six dollars stock earning seven dollars a share. Uh, this thing ca can be a multi bagger even from here where it's already tripled. Uh, and then finally is um, uh, Crown Castle. They've got 40,000 cell phone towers. Uh, Elliot, it, it's two, it's one, it's a, a, a play on rates. Okay, so as rates come down, REITs and utilities are gonna do well. Uh, two, you now have an activist in there uh, with uh, Paul Singer Elliot, and he basically said, um, he wrote a nice letter to the board. He said, I'd like to fire you. I'd like to fire your CEO. And by the way, Mrs. Lincoln, how was the play? Uh, other than that, he's got wants to sell off the uh, small cell and fiber business, which their competitors that have outperformed them did not get into, sell that off, and then uh, it, it just uh, let the legacy tower business generate huge return on invested capital. Uh, if they're successful, I think uh, even though it's already moved 20%, I think it can work its way towards 200 over the next 24 to 36 months. So those are kind of the plays that we like in the turnaround and smid cap space. Yeah, uh, Elliot, uh, of course, uh, they know what to do. They definitely are good at shaking it up uh, yeah. companies and uh, pushing forward. So uh, we'll see how that continues. Now, of course, the common question is to ask about the promising opportunities, but I'm also going to flip it here. And which stocks would you kind of maybe avoid or maybe sectors or industries to avoid? Of course, with high interest rates, maybe the common things are, you know, the fancy things and nice watches. What do you guys think going into 24? What are the stocks to maybe avoid? Uh, Mike? Yeah, so so um, right now, um, I, I think I'm not as bullish on the energy sector um, as I, I, I'd say my peers. I'd say um, we saw what happened in 2016. The most notable uh, stock movement that, that people don't talk about from 2016 is when Trump won. The um, the energy sector sold off hard, and that's 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 what I think you could see a big change is because you're going to see a massive change in energy policy if the election goes towards Republicans, and so um, 
you know, in my process, energy uh, is showing up as a, uh, you know, a larger percentage than I have it at. So I'm, I'm half of what, you know, my models show me at um, in energy. Um, consumer discretionary outside of Amazon, um, I, I don't, I, I don't, I, I have a hard time seeing this consumer strength going forward, particularly at the credit card problems, what we're seeing there, what you're seeing in the used car market. Um, it, it's, I believe we're in for a rocky road. And I, I think a lot of what happened this year in the Magnificent Seven um, and, and the overall stock performance actually does signify a weakening economy because a lot of these big names have become your consumer staples. So you, you think of Google as like one of the best growth names over the last couple of decades and, you know, Microsoft and Apple, where well, the reality is these are the businesses with the cleanest balance sheets, uh, the best, um, the most recession resilient business models. And I, I'd say, I'd say we'd be hard pressed for that to change without a meaningful economic turnaround. I do not, um, I do not like the banks until we have a steepening yield curve. And I think, these banks have blown away uh, earnings and revenue estimates this year. Um, but the what's behind that, again, is taking uh, money from depositors, which they pay nothing and getting 5% uh, from the Fed. So if those rates come down, that's a reduced earning power, earnings power plus additional write-offs, additional loan loss reserves. So I, I'm, I, you know, it's not that I don't own any, any energy, but instead of, say, 15%, where my model said I should be, I'm at a five. And then I, I don't own, you know, the only financials I own uh, is Truist, which is just a regional story where the bank's still at about 80% of its book value. But I think these regionals are in for a tough ride because you're still seeing the deposit flight from the, um, you know, from either these regionals to the uh, money center or from the regionals to the money markets. Michael, I'd ask, because uh, I did a video on commercial real estate, do you think that that would be an issue for the regional banks in 24? Oh, yeah. Um, it, it's going to be an issue for these banks for the next decade, right? Uh, um, it, it's it, it's the ones that are heavy into office. You know, you, you got to go line item by line item and see how much is priced in. Because where I am in Sarasota, Florida, uh, there's very little office space for rent. Uh, you walk around. Midtown Manhattan and other places, um, you know, those uh, those those floors could be better used for uh, for football games, right? And throwing a you know playing an indoor river ball than uh, because nobody's at work there. And so I, I don't. It's very difficult to transition those uh, to residential. Maybe in Manhattan they can figure it out, but other places it's just the nature of the construction. And I have a friend that's um, runs you know billions of dollars of um commercial real estate and in the way that he put it his office they're, they're like pyramids in that um everyone thinks they're beautiful and they look at them and they're all these trophies but at the end of the day like what's the real use uh, of a pyramid and like what's yeah. the value of it so it's like until i mean i think everybody's going who's going back to the office is there so if you have a lot of this office space is vacant and you know, this debt, these are only problems until they start to roll over. And regardless of the rate environment, you know, are, are you going to, if you're a landlord at a certain point, it makes sense to give the keys back. And if you're a bank, you know, if the place is a third occupied, you know, um, it, it, you can. Write offs are coming, aren't they? I mean, it feels like it. Yeah, well, it, it, you know, you can, um, you. <laughs> You know, you might want to be at 50% loan to value for that note. You may say, okay, well, now I'm only going to lend 40% loan to value. And by the way, the value is about a third of what we valued it at before. Uh, does a landlord want to come up with the equity? So uh, I think that's a problem. It's, it, but it's in terms of putting banks and having setting off a banking crisis, it, it depends on how, how much it happens at once, right? And so if this happens over time, it will hamper banks' earnings abilities, but it will not put banks under, right? Because the commercial lending, you know, that the commercial lending is, it's a very profitable business. And so as long as those write downs are spread out, you just have a, you have, you'll, you'll see reduced multiples, reduced earnings from these banks, but not necessarily a, a wave of banks going under like the savings and loan crisis of the eighties. But it's, um, this is a problem that is going to plague us for like a decade, I think. All right, let's go to Thomas here. Of course, the original question here was on downside of stocks and maybe potentials that you might want to avoid out there. What are you seeing out there, Tom? 
Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm a little more sanguine on, on next year's uh, economic and uh, market performance. I mean, statistically speaking, um, you know, we're, if we finish this year up 18, 20, 22 so, percent, somewhere in that range, it's unlikely we're going to replicate that type of performance. But it certainly would not surprise me to see high single digits or low double digits next year going into the election. I think the year after the election is historically when you have a little more uh, concern and, and I'd, I'd, I'd probably start to uh, take a closer look at, at some of uh, what Mike is talking about that's probably down the pike. Uh, but in the interim, in that context, 8 to 12%, the implication there is that the Magnificent Seven uh, large cap tech is going to slow down. I think they're going to be fine. I think the, the performance is going to slow down. And I think where the opportunities are going to be is under the surface uh, in, in what we're, we've started to see in the last few weeks, which is the broadening of the rally small and mid will start to, to perform. And people will say, well, how the heck is small cap going to perform if you've got all these regional bank waiting? Uh, and the answer to the question is um, uh, a lot of the banking crisis in March, the mini banking crisis in March was attributable to, you know, the federal government gave people all these stimulus checks. The banks got record amounts of deposits. They had to put that money to work at the exact wrong time when, when rates were basically zero. So they tried to take quote unquote limited risk and they put them in five to seven year treasuries uh, at the exact wrong time. And then Powell comes in and says, oh, by the way, I, I wasn't transitory. And he went on this like maniacal uh, tightening cycle and left the banks upside down. Rates ha are starting to drop pretty precipitously even before any cuts. So we've gone from 5% on the 10 year to you know 411 today what that's doing on a mark to market basis for regional banks is miracles. OK, so so what caused the uh, small bank, small banks to drop 40, 50 and in, on a case by case basis, some 80 um, percent is now in the rearview mirror. Those mark to markets are actually improving. So, yes, there will be discrete commercial real estate workouts like we saw from 90 to 95 and the market did perfectly fine. The economy did perfectly fine. Even in the SNL crisis during the 80s, uh, you had regional workouts in Texas because oil blew up and everything else. Um, but it will muddle through because to your point, the banks don't want the properties. So what are they going to do? They're going to extend and pretend they're going to hold the marks at par or, or, or take less marks than they have to. And they'll just stretch out the pain over time. So it will be less acute. And in the meantime, their risk free portfolios have have appreciated materially, uh, which gives them regulatory capital that if good risk starts to come back into the market where they can lend, uh, uh, they can do that. So um, I'm not saying, you know, have 50 percent, you know, small banks by any stretch of the imagination. But I'm saying people are underestimating um, the impact that can have on small caps. And I would say that the short answer is, I think your big tech tech going to be fine, like Mike said. Uh, I think it'll be do less well than what we've just saw, seen in the rear view mirror. And the opportunity is in those things that are just starting to play catch up in the last four to six weeks, which implies there's a little more juice left in this cycle. And I'm of that opinion at least 12 to 18 months uh, in which case that they, they will have nice runs and uh, and follow through on what we've seen in the last couple of months. All right, let's wrap it up with, of course, uh, the big R word, and uh, let's we'll do it on a percentage basis for recession in twenty four. Uh, would you cue that up to ninety hundred? How do you guys see it? Let's go first to Michael. So, so um, you know, you're. <laughs> um, I think there are parts of the economy that have been in recession, right? Okay. Um, for certain segments uh, of the economy have been in recession since uh, for 18 months now. And what you're going to see, and I think what the phenomena um, stopping, stopping us from having a quote unquote official recession is the massive amounts of government spending. And this, um, so, you know, I'd say an official recession where you have two quarters uh, negative GDP growth, I'd say that's about, uh, roughly a third that we see that this calendar year, simply because a lot of that infrastructure bill that was passed in 2021 yeah. is going to start to come online. And, and like the massive amounts of government, that's kind of like, whereas if you take out these one-time government spends, like you're clearly there and um, it's, it's a tale of, tale of two economies. So for 
many in smaller markets um, on the tertiary, it's going to feel like a recession as it has. And so you're already seeing that in a lot of the, what you call quote unquote soft data, the ISM surveys uh, and some of the re regional manufacturing surveys, like some of these comments from respondents are horrific. And it's, you're seeing things that you haven't seen since uh, to, to, you know, 2008 or March, April of 2020. Whereas uh, we could skate through this and have this, you know, Bigfoot uh, soft landing where it's really just um, one-time government spending that messes with the calculation. So I, I, I'd say it's, it's, it's less than um, um, the probability of an official recession is far less than I described with the deteriorating economic data. But nonetheless, uh, it's, it's, still, it's still ugly for a large segment of the economy. All right, let's go to Tom and we'll wrap it up. What are you feeling here, Tom, for recession and the percentages, chances of it being a recession in 24? Yeah, I think Mike's right that we've had these rolling recessions going for a while. Um, you know, manufacturing has been in a recession for, you know, a couple of years. Uh, we kind of had a tech spend recession in 2022. We actually had a technical recession. You know, the, the thing that I said uh, a lot, like Q3, Q4, Q1, 2, 3, 4 of this year, uh, was that everyone's waiting for a recession that already happened. And, you know, we, we did have a technical recession in 2022. But now, you know, we've been running for a while. So, uh, you know, I could certainly see some softness in 25. But uh, 2024, the odds of another technical recession, like we had uh, in Q1 and Q2 of 2022, and in uh, uh, Q2 and Q3 of 2020, um, I think are, are very low. I mean, 15%. 20%. I think those odds go up a little bit in 2025, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll see if there's any velocity to all that spend that Mike's talking about, the IRA money coming in. Uh, is, there, is there more than a one-off kind of dead cat bounce from that, or, or does it actually spark a fire of economic growth, in which case that would take uh, meaningful slowness off the table in 2025? So. Uh, it remains to be seen, but uh, pretty sanguine on 2024. Yeah, being here in uh, downtown Detroit, I mean, you guys can see it right behind me. The people skating. I mean, everyone's out and about shopping. The holidays are doing great. So. How about that office? Is it filled or, or empty? What's the story? Oh, it, it, we have a, a pretty good filled office. Uh, yeah. I'm actually going to do a shot. Uh, you guys will see this. <laughs> and, uh, I'll do a little bit of a... We have a camera on the ceiling there. We'll take a look at the office and show everybody. But it's great to have you, of course, always. Michael Lee from Michael Lee Strategy. Thomas Hayes, chairman of Great Hill Capital. Some of my favorite follows definitely on Twitter. So if you're not following these guys, you're definitely missing out. It's always great to have you guys. We'll have you back on right here on Benzinga's 2024 Outlook. It's great to have you. Thank you Thanks, for joining me. Thanks, man. And we're back. So let's move on to some of the other subjects. Uh, I think uh, Alibaba's green today, so we really don't have anything more to cover. Uh, I'm joking. Um, oh, I also want you to listen in. Uh, my friend Chris Kleinhart, he's a very successful executive and investor and capital allocator based in Dallas, Texas. Uh, he did a podcast this week. Uh, it's You can Google it on Yahoo. Uh, Lead with Kindness with Chris Kleinhart and Julian Placino, if you are in a leadership role, uh, I think this is such an amazing uh, 38 minutes of kind of advice and context from a guy I know personally walks his walk and he talks about this concept of pouring in. Uh, I've experienced this and I think uh, it's a reminder uh, for those in people of uh, positions of authority and influence uh this is a great context to work from and uh and i've learned a lot uh knowing him and 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 being friends with him for for some time now so take a listen when you have a chance uh this is the <laughs> this is the uh tlt etf i just wanted to draw this up because if you remember uh you know in september and october every week we were saying this is going to turn Positions are the you know hedge funds are the most short they've ever been since bonds since the the lows in two thousand October in two thousand and eighteen and sure enough uh, not only have we turned we're going parabolic and we're near 
going positive. If you also remember on some of my public uh, um, appearances, I talked about uh, that this would be the first time, I think, in 100 years where bonds close negative three years in a row. I wouldn't bet on it. So we'll see. We're, we're touching up against uh, being, you know, the bonds going positive for the year and just a couple of weeks, uh, you know, short um, periods of weeks ago, no one would have believed that. And when it turns, it turns all at once. And I think that's an interesting concept. We'll talk a little bit about Baba today, but uh, I could say a couple of things. Number one, um, uh, we talked about last week in, in client accounts where the position sizing of Alibaba had gotten so small because all of the rest of the portfolio had gone up so much relative to it, we've where there's been room, we've brought it back up to uh, at or near max position size. Uh, uh, for myself, where I'm willing to take uh, uh, more risk, uh, I've, I've dramatically in, in, increased my position. Um, so a couple of things here. First and foremost, if you look at earnings growth, so while China on the whole had been a little slower because the recovery has been a little slower, if you look at growth for tech, broadline retail, interactive media and services, the last two quarters you've seen this, the strongest earnings growth since Q2 and Q3 of 2020. 20, and that was right before the parabolic move to uh, 320. So a lot of good things are in place. The other thing you need to keep in mind, what, what have we been saying for some time, okay? We're, it's like back to the future. You know, Alibaba was $72 last um, Mar March, I think, then it dropped to, so we're back to the future from, you know, March of 2022, 20, then it dropped to $58 in October of 2023 then it doubled overnight uh when um xi blinked and opened the country from covid uh went from 60 to 120 in like eight weeks uh then the recovery wasn't ha happening as fast as possible because they weren't doing the stimulus as quickly as possible and people's confidence had eroded because they'd been locked up into in their own apartments against their will for so long uh, and now you're just starting to see this stuff come out. And this is when people acutely don't believe that anything good can ever happen again in China, which is specifically when you want to be getting exposed. The other thing that we said had to happen for uh, risk to come on into emerging markets is the dollar had to start to weaken, which is happening, uh, as well as the uh, uh, Fed needed to stop tightening which uh, we're going to find out, uh, well, number one, they stopped tightening in July. But number two, uh, I think we're going to see on the 13th that the dot plot has zero future hikes in it. I think the market's probably overestimating the number of cuts next year, but they, they certainly have hikes. So that piece has fallen in place. The PCAOB issue of delisting has now fallen into place. They have inspected 100% of the companies in China. They issued a, a few fines and uh, the, the companies will remain listed in the US. So as it relates to BABA itself, a couple of things. There is some limitation on how much stock they can buy back at the moment, despite having all the cash, because of capital controls and how much they can move out of the country. I think two things will alleviate that. Number one, is uh, disposing the non-core assets, which is about 60 to $70 billion worth of non-core assets, which they're doing, uh, which we covered in the article this week. Two, as rates come down, they can actually issue debt internationally to do massive buybacks. Uh, and number three, when they do a Hong Kong listing, the dual listing, which we've been talking about, uh, which will happen sometime after March, is our expectation. Uh, that should uh, alleviate as well as open up all the liquidity from the Stock Connect buyers, which we had talked about that, um, ha you know, people in mainland China that have never been able to own Alibaba, which which is uh, uh, pretty amazing. Um, I, I think those are some keys kind of highlights at the highest level. Want to go into a couple more things here as far as the downgrades. We had some AMA questions on that. 
And I like this quote from Viraj Patel uh, in Bloomberg from Band of Research. He said, these ratings downgrades or negative outlook shifts often mark the low in terms of bad news or market sell-offs. He's relating to the Chinese downgrade by Moody's. We agree, similar to the Morgan Stanley downgrade last week. As a matter of fact, um, we're going to, ah, here we go. Morgan Stanley upgraded Alibaba on July 6, 2021. That's right here, this blue circle right here, you can see on the chart, with a price target of 300. So when it was at uh, 230 or 240, they were looking uh, for it to go back to 300. Uh, instead, the exact opposite happened and it went down to $58. Now, uh, on July, uh, rather on, uh, what date was that? I don't know, call it December 3rd. Alibaba was trading at $73. Morgan Stanley uh, downgrades Alibaba. Uh, December 1st, they downgraded Alibaba at $73. It probably marked at or near the bottom, uh, just as their upgrade to $300 marked at or near the top and it's just the way it works opinion follows trend they're not bad people or trying to do something they're just like every retail trader who's driven by emotion uh you know trying to save their job etc and uh and it just simply doesn't work so um thank you for that thank you for the signal this genius downgrade of alibaba in the hole reminds me of all the banks downgrading range resources in 2019 and 2020 between a dollar and 50 cents and five dollars at the exact wrong time uh, i pulled this from the wayback machine and here's what happened next hint eight bagger uh so here you can see every single bank 2019 from january 2019 through uh, May of 2020, they were all downgrading and putting price targets between uh, $2 and basically $6. And here's what's ha what happened next. Um, here's where all the downgrades were happening. It went from 91 uh, all the way down. They were after it went from 91 down to 10. They started downgrading in the single digits at around seven or eight. And then uh, we've had an eight bagger since. Um, well, we have, I mean, people who had actually bought at their downgrades at 150, our basis was 410. Uh, so uh, four times nine is 36, 800% gain uh, on, that, um, on that downgrade. So that marked the lows and that happens over and over and over again. They're not trying to be wrong. It's just, they can't help themselves. So, um, last night oh okay so this was another tweet uh last night i put out my podcast i got a very smart comment from a viewer and wanted to share some perspective on alibaba and meta to him said in the youtube comments by the way um you know uh, a lot of you have uh, written that you've gotten such amazing value but you can't afford to invest because you don't have a million dollars used to be 5 million, but uh, after we registered, we were able to take more, more accounts. Uh, and you wanna help in some way. The number one way you can help is uh, like at the YouTube video, leave your comments, subscribe to the channel. Uh, that'll help the YouTube algorithm show it to more qualified people. Uh, that will enable this to keep going, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so Tuhin said, in the comments thank you so much for your excellent video hope you had a wonderful thanksgiving baba is in the same place today where big tech us big tech were last year uh, probably tax loss harvesting and far uh, fund managers chasing momentum okay so i said good analogy to him meta in particular was down from 384 to 88 dollars just like Baba is down from $320 to $70, both huge free cash flow generators. And when they turn, they turn hard because the fundamentals are there. They're cash generative businesses. You don't just buy a business because it's down and it's losing money. You buy it because it's a good business and it's out of favor. And many people bought Meta at $150, uh, down from $320 which was a great price, by the way. And they didn't hang on because 
of the price dropping to $88. So they bought it at 150, it dropped to 108, uh, dropped down to 88. So they puked it out because they thought that price was telling them something and everyone else knew something that they didn't know. All everyone else knew was that they were getting margin calls from their broker and because they were idiots on leverage, they got the stock stolen away from them at $88 in the hole coupled with dumb downgrades from analysts uh, that stole their stock out of their hands. And what happened next? It's at $327. And now at $327, when the analysts can't get enough of it, uh, Mark Zuckerberg's laying off stock in the public markets. Mark wasn't selling at $88. You were selling at $88. You meaning not this audience, of course, but the general public was selling at $88. And now at 327, when all the analysts are upgrading it and everyone wants it, Zuckerberg's laying off stock. So what is that? What do you need to know? OK, now, if they knew what they owned at one hundred fifty dollars or at one hundred dollars or even if they bought it two hundred dollars and it dropped down to eighty eight, um, they could have bought more as price moved against them in the short term. So even if they started at 200 or $150, rather than puking it in the hole thinking price was telling them something, which is just a bunch of emotional traders getting conned by the sell side with their downgrades and getting their stock stolen from them, uh, what they would have done is bought more. And even if they were, quote, wrong, buying it at 180 or $150, they could have brought their basis down to 110 to 115 dollars and i'm telling you guys in the last week i've added so much stock because of all the other stuff that's gone up so much that uh i've been able to add more baba uh if i told you what my basis was you 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 wouldn't believe it i mean it's so low now that this thing doesn't have to move a lot for me to make an enormous amount of money so um so that was the opportunity. The opportunity, even if you didn't, if you bought at 50% off for a high quality business at 150 and you weren't able to add more at 80 or 100 to bring your basis down to you know, 100, $110, rather than making a three bagger in a year, you made a two bagger in a year because quote, when it turns, it turns all at once when you're dealing with high quality cash generative businesses. So. Uh, you know, that's the story. Now everyone wants Meta at 320. The same is going to happen with Alibaba. No one believes it, but I've just been to this movie too many times before. And some take longer. You know, I referenced range resources. That took uh, five years to get 800%. So I don't know. Maybe I missed something that would have been better, but I think that uh, I'm perfectly comfortable with that opportunity cost. So here's the whole fear about Pin Duo Duo versus Alibaba. So I just, for comedic effect, uh, decided to be burdened by the facts and put the numbers side by side. Um, and you can see what they did. So Pin Duo Duo now has a slightly larger market cap than Alibaba. Uh, their revenues last quarter were nine billion. Alibaba's were thirty billion. Their gross profit was five billion. Alibaba's was eleven billion. Their operating income was $2 billion, Alibaba's was $7 billion, and on and on and on. Uh, Alibaba's uh, free cash flow was double, um, and they've got uh, net cash on the balance sheet of double what Pin Duo Duo has. Now, people say, oh my God, um, aren't you afraid that Pin Duo uh, Timu's going to take all this share from Alibaba? And the answer is, they're not competing really in the same markets. The growth for Pinduoduo has come from the United States. They're selling cheap junk uh, at low prices to Americans. And what they've effectively, honestly, it's a bigger threat for Amazon. And if Amazon didn't have such a good AWS business, I'd be more concerned about holding Amazon because You've had this situation where all these sellers, US-based sellers, would just buy stuff from Ali Cloud, uh, AliExpress or uh, Chinese manufacturers and then resell it on Amazon's website at US-type prices. So what Timu has basically done is it's just selling at those Chinese manufacturer prices 
in the US right now and cutting out all those middlemen, which Amazon makes a vig on. AliExpress was never big in the US. AliExpress is the international division that grew like 72% last quarter uh, uh, for Alibaba, but their growth is happening in Eastern Europe and Europe. And now they've got this uh, Ali Choice, which is starting to grow like crazy, which will compete with uh, Timu uh, in the US and other places. So Alibaba has the cash and the reserves and the knowledge and, a, and an AI advantage that they can crush Pinduo Duo in those markets. But those aren't really where they compete. And as it relates to China, Taobao and Tmall tends to be higher end. And in the short term, uh, that's where you know Timu's done okay. But in the intermediate term, as the economy continues to recover, uh, Chinese people like the higher end stuff, and uh, Taobao and Tmall owns that. So, um, uh, as a matter of fact, that was evidenced by an article in the Wall Street Journal. You know, the headline was Timu is uh, changing the world, and then if you read between the lines, uh, Timu's growth in the U.S. seems to have plateaued lately. This is at the end of the article. Uh, most monthly active users in the U.S. this quarter are down 6% from the previous quarter, according to Sensor Tower. The other thing is, um, uh, bank account. okay. Timu is likely still losing money, though. PDD's operating margin last quarter, for example, narrowed to 24% from 29% a year earlier. So that's another aspect is the acquisition cost, which Alibaba has been disciplined about, and that's why they're generating the cash. They're, they're trying to re-incentivize uh, recurring daily active users versus huge acquisition costs for new daily active users. It's just a difference of things, but they're fully cognizant of what's going on with PDD. Uh, uh, and Timu, the good news, the bad news, the markets. And also, Bob is trying to be more disciplined about the markets they enter and the startup costs to enter those markets. So, um, you know, it is what it is. Uh, Alphabet stock, you know, this, this again, you know, when everyone was buying, uh, puking out Meta, and we talked about it on the podcast, we were in aggressively last fall, not this last fall when no one wanted tech, buying uh, Amazon, Alphabet, and um, Intel, because no one wanted se semiconductors, and all those have taken off like rocket ships. Uh, uh, Intel almost getting to a double, or it had a little pullback this week, uh, getting close. Uh, Alphabet and Amazon both up more than 50, 60 percent. There'll be doubles. Um, but now people were worried about Alphabet versus ChatGPT and what we saw yesterday with the release of Bard with Gemini is that their version is actually smarter than the ChatGPT, uh, which means they're fully in the game. And um, one of the founders, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, I think it's Sergey, uh, might be Larry. I don't know. One of them has been working in the office for like nine months to make sure that they have the best AI offering and they delivered yesterday. So devices and door handle stock market and sentiment results. So we've been trying to catch up after a great earnings season and highlight the results from one to two companies per week that we've talked about on our weekly podcast video cast. This week, we're going to do Baxter and AAP. If you remember, Baxter was down due to the GLP-1 nonsense that, um, and by the way, Walmart actually came out yesterday and saying, man, maybe we overreacted. It's not quite having the impact that we thought about the cart, i.e. Our, our clients are back to loving their ding-dongs and Twinkies and uh, all the garbage that they've loved for decades. Uh, they're going to continue to love in perpetuity. Um, so a couple of things from the podcast, from their um call uh baxter they increased revenues three percent year on year uh they they exceeded guidance both on the top line and the bottom line they simplified the business into four verticalized business segments um which are the medical products and therapies healthcare systems and technologies pharmaceuticals and kidney care kidney care is going to be spun off uh they also sold the biopharma uh, solutions divestiture 
for four billion and change. They're going to give out three point seven billion of cash, which they'll use uh, to um, reduce leverage on the balance sheet. And that is going to, I think, lower their interest cost by forty million uh, moving forward. Let me just pull this up. Okay, so. On demand. Okay, better than estimates. We talked about that. Just go through some of the key highlights here. Yeah, so they're going to use that for debt repayment because if you remember, they took on a decent amount of debt to buy Hillrom, and that execution didn't go as well as planned, but now it's starting to actually gain traction. And the innovation of their launches is catching. Um, catching a, a tailwind as well as hospital admissions, which is like a one-to-one -one correlation with their growth. Um, they actually took their forward guidance up to 4% uh, revenue growth and the kidney care spin. Now, he said a lot about the expectations around dialysis demand 10 to 15 years out despite the GLP-1. So we'll talk about that as well. They're also having success with their pharmaceutical business coming back. They launched multiple injectable pharmaceutical molecules, which uh, have been more successful than anticipated. If you walk into any doctor's office, you'll see Baxter and Welch Allen and uh, many of their other brands basically on every device uh, around you. It's it's. Uh, uncanny when you actually go to the doctor's office and see that. Uh, and you look division by di division, whether you're talking uh, medical devices and product therapies up 5%, uh, drug compounding up 15%, pharmaceuticals up 10%, kidney care up 1%, uh, and then their free cash flow, which is probably the most important of any of them in the nine, nine months year to date, 600 million. You know, that's one of the key things that we look for in 95% of the turnarounds that we do is if they're generating free cash flow and bankruptcies more or less off the table, um, then we don't really have anything to worry about if we're not on leverage and we believe that the in, in this case, in this cycle, at pretty much every stock we did, whether Intel, um, uh, Stanley Black & Decker, Generac, um, it was all the exact same story over inventory during COVID because they couldn't get parts and then they had to work through their inventory in Q1 and Q2 of this year. Most of them have done that and now they're all inflecting and the operating leverage is coming in. Uh, and they did 666 million of free cash flow. Um, uh, oh, okay, 595 was continuing operation, 666 uh, included the uh, discontinued operations and they're going to focus on uh, four focus areas for their capital capital allocation, portfolio management, you know, getting rid of the businesses that aren't profitable, uh, innovating, adding more businesses, debt repayment, dividends to shareholders and shareholder repurchases. Uh, you can see the reported growth for all the four segments. They're, they're going up. They're all inflecting again. This is a big deal. Uh, sales were up 3%. You know, again, if cash flow is there, and growing from uh, from the trough. And so it's, it's funny, by the way, I pulled up the earnings call transcript last night and I was reading it and marking it. And I was like, God, what the hell is wrong with this company? They can't figure out their supply chain. It's 2023. Like what, like what, you know, maybe I should get out of this stock because uh, this is a train wreck. Like if they can't do this by 2023, like you need new management. <laughs> and then I scrolled up to the top of the uh, <laughs> top of the thing, and it was uh, Q3 2022. <laughs> and I was like, thank God. And when I was reading this, it was like, we've solved this supply chain issue. We've solved that. And I'm like, there you go. They said they were going to do it, and they actually d did it, uh, which is great. That, this article took me a lot longer to write than normal, which is why I was up super late and you may may hear it a little bit in my voice and now i've got to get to boston to watch mimi swim the 500 she did like a i think she did a 508 in the 400 im championship uh last weekend in stanford which was amazing i don't have any pictures for that someone criticized me on youtube for posting pictures of my kids 
Uh, but you know, it's 2023. I don't think you can really avoid that. And, uh, I'm proud of them and it motivates them. So I'm going to keep doing it. So, but thank you for the opinion, not advice. Um, anyway, so here we are driven by end market stabilization, good sequential margin. And that's the other thing. Top line's going up. Margins are improving. Cash flow is going up all the things you want to see. And then price will eventually catch up, which, uh, which we're less concerned about. Cause again, you know, Charlie Munger, the legend, uh, three things in excess will kill you. Uh, ladies, liquor and leverage, <laughs> stick to one lady, get, get it right the first time, uh, if you can, or the second or third, but just stick to one is, is good policy. Uh, liquor, I've, I've never been a, that's, that's not for me and leverage, uh, very minimal at, at most. Um, and you can sit through these uh, crazy times uh, when the world, you know, uh, the Rudyard Kimpling forward, uh, poem, when the world is losing their mind and you just sit steady, the world is yours, my son, and you'll be a man or whatever the quote was. We've gone over it many times. Uh, let's go here. Uh, he's also, okay, this is very important. He says, it's premature to assume that these drugs, he's referring to GLP ones, particularly given the full trial results have yet to be published, will bring about any material shift in the need for dialysis services from a global market perspective. We believe that dialysis therapy will remain in demand and a critical element of patient care for the foreseeable future. The existing data on demographics and disease patterns continue to consistently suggest that the global incidence of end-stage kidney disease, ESKD, will continue to rise over the next 15 to 20 years. To provide a bit more context, the current data suggests that the global ESKD incidents overall will continue to grow, driven by a greater than 35% expected increase in the prevalence of diabetes by 2040. At the same time, global demographic data show that the number of people over 65 years old should be increasing by approximately 75% globally between now and 2040, which is also expected to increase the number of potential patients at risk of developing ESKD. Collectively, these macro changes suggest that global incidence of ESKD is expected to continue to rise over the next 15 to 20 years, even with important innovations in CKD therapeutics, we also believe these new drugs are doing important work in raising awareness and prevalence of primary care discussions about CKD diagnosis and management. Uh, the informed patient uh, about their treatment options, the more, the more informed the patient is, the more likely they are to choose home dialysis over other forms of di dialysis when given the option, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, they are spinning off that business next year. It'll be done by July. And the temptation you're going to have is to sell that piece. Uh, I think the surprise is going to be historically spinoffs actually outperform the parents by about 20 percent in the 24 months uh, following the spin. Don't be tempted to sell that piece. Keep that piece. Um, the question you're going to want to ask, do you keep the Baxter piece? And I would say you keep both pieces. But, you know, that's a long time away. We'll figure it out as we go along. Uh, in the first nine months of 2023, we generated free cash flow of 666 million, including dis discontinued operations compared to 293 million in the prior year period. And we remain on track to more than double our free cash flow in 2023 from prior levels. So, I mean, we don't even need to talk about the rest of that, but uh, we expect a reduction in net interest expense of approximately 45 million by the fourth quarter. Remember, they got the 3.7 bill, they're paying down some debt. For the full year, we expect net interest expense to be approximately 450. Um, ba, ba, ba. Okay, so they replaced key positions in Hillrom. Uh, Hillrom is uh, going to have a very large fourth quarter in terms of growth compared to the rest of the year and bring them more in line with our expectations, including its profitability, which will increase the fourth quarter as the rest of the company. Overall, full year operating margin guidance we gave of 14.3 to 4.5 implies a fourth quarter adjusted, rating, adjusted operating margin that exceeds 16% versus the 15.2% uh, adjusted operating margin that we landed in the third quarter. So they continue to improve margins sequentially out of the trough. This is textbook turnaround Tom type numbers. Uh, this is <laughs> over and over, rinse, repeat. Uh, primary driver, da da da. Okay, uh, here we go again. 
Uh, expansion is driven not just by the higher sales, but by cost favorability in our supply chain network as we quote, sold through a lot of our higher cost inventory during the first half of the year. Higher cost inventory was purchased when? During the pandemic, when the supply chains were bad. This is like, I'm telling you, I am so excited for all of you who came in this year, uh, um, in the summertime, in the fall time, in the springtime, because we really got into businesses that you don't get, you know, you get pandemics once every hundred years and you guys are in these unbelievable businesses at such advantageous times that don't come around every minute. I mean, there's always opportunities, but um, the, the way the stars aligned was just pretty amazing. And it was lucky that I was able to accept uh, the smaller accounts uh, um, at the end of the summer as well. Uh, okay. So the analyst acting, asking what's getting better, what's getting worse in 2024. We see stability in the market in admissions, market growth rates. You saw some of the published numbers from the other companies, their hospitals, we see that as well. And we continue to have a pretty stable top line growth and consistently into 2024. So I'm confident about that. We have uh, XR Kidney Care, the other three businesses, Baxter have steady growth into next year. They will probably be higher than in 2023. Sequential improvement in our bottom line that will continue in 2024. We continue to have cost reductions in manufacturing facilities. We also get more stable volume and growth pricing opportunities in a couple of our businesses. Turnaround that you're seeing in our pharmaceuticals business that will continue with new product launches from 23 to 24. Also the good demand for Sigma Spectrum Pump from 23 to 24, just to mention a couple of things. Also stabilization of the Hillrom business, stabilization and successful launch of Progressive Plus. Uh, a couple of things that give us confidence about 2024 in terms of top and bottom line. Uh, so they're going to do 4% top line growth uh, coming off of 2% this year, which, uh, which is pretty exciting. Um, expectations to be 4 to 5% top line growth mid to long term. Remember, they're bringing that uh, operating margins up. They're bringing uh, interest expense down. It's all going to go to the bottom line. That's why we love these businesses with huge operating leverage coming out of troughs. Uh, so long as their cash flow positive and bankruptcy risk is off the table, all of those things were in place with this. And now we just sit along for the ride, sit on our hands and stay put. Advanced auto parts. We covered this one like three or four weeks ago verbally, but we never wrote about it. So we want to get everything in text uh, with the new CEO from HD Supply, Shane Ke uh, Sean Kelly. Shane O'Kelly, excuse me. Uh, he ran HD Supply, which is a $7 billion business that caters to the uh, professional market contractors uh, for Home Depot. And um, so despite, you know, kind of the worst part of the trough here, new CEO, everything, they still grew sales by 2.9% year on year, which boggles the mind considering the stock is down uh, 231 to, it got down to, $47, so 80 some odd percent, uh, at least. Um, now it's rebounding back up into the mid fifties, but they've got three key things. They're gonna sell their Canadian businesses, the uh, World Pack and the Quest Core, uh, and they're gonna use it, uh, they're gonna cut $150 million of costs, and they're going to reinvest in their frontline people, which historically have been uh, the gateway to the uh, do it for you, the professionals that buy auto parts. So they have what they call a blended box. Do it yourself. You know, the guy who goes in and changes his own battery in the parking lot and the do it for you, which is the guy in the local garage who changes your battery for you or your brakes for you, et cetera, or your oil for you. And they supply parts to them. Uh, the key to getting the do it for you people is having knowledgeable people at the counter and getting the parts to them quicker than anyone else. In the local garages that I spoke to, um, they all said that of O'Reilly, Advance, and AutoZone, um, Advance 
always got the parts quickest and always had the most knowledgeable people at the counter. They made a mistake before the CEO came in and they retraded on price, which pissed off a lot of people like Napa. So this new CEO is now going in and you'll see, he said, we had some cost increase that we're not passing through to the client. So what they're doing is basically rebuilding trust, uh, being uh, price competitive and getting those accounts back, which is gonna be fantastic. Um, and then of the 150 million cost cuts, they're gonna put 50 into the frontline people and make sure they keep the knowledgeable people versus O'Reilly who takes someone who used to stock shelves at Walmart and ask them to talk about brakes and distributors and spark plugs, which they know nothing about, which pisses off the, the uh, do it for you professionals. Whereas Advance has always attracted those people who actually understand cars, know parts and can speak intelligently with the professionals, which is a huge part of their business. Um, okay, so uh, they still uh, operating cash flow was 30.4 million. So again, uh, free cash flow was negative. That's not exciting, but they've got a plan to turn it around and they've got enough cushion uh, and they've got a good enough business and a good enough history through cycles that uh, we were confident to take a shot. Um, so first off, they're getting rid of World Pack. That's going to pay down a lot of debt. Uh, two, they're getting rid of the Quest Core Canadian business. Three, the cost reductions. Four, the 50 million in the field. And five, they got a new CFO who came from Lowe's, by the way, which also has a professional and a do-it-yourself for business and um, a lot of M&A experience. So it's the right guy at the right time. Um, See if he added any more color that we need to cover quickly here, or we can move on to the AMA. So sales up 2.9, that's key. If they cut the cost, the free cash flow will start to a uh, hockey stick and you'll be at $100 quickly. And then from there, then that's the low hanging fruit. And then from there, they've got to execute. And then that's how we work back up to mid 100s. And at that point, we make a decision if we want to keep it. We'll do, we'll see how excited the analysts are from Morgan Stanley. If they start upgrading like crazy, maybe we'll lay it off. But uh, for now, we got a long way to go. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. So in the most recent quarter. Uh, free cash flow in the quarter was an inflow of 148 million uh, and year to date was an outflow of 157. So they're 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 starting to inflect and, and turn cash flow positive. That's what we need to see. Uh, decisive actions. The other point that he made was we don't need to sell QuestCore or the Canadian business. There's no urgency to do so. If the right if we get the right price, we'll take it. If not, we'll run it. It's perfectly fine. And that was also confidence building uh, in hearing that uh, the initiative is less around raising cash and more around creating focus so they, they can be the best at what they do with the blended box to DIFY and DIY clients um, and, and focus on the Omni channel all around the advanced auto parts business. Um, uh, you've seen over the last two quarters, we continue to generate positive cash flow in each of those quarters. As we continue to focus on the business, focus on sales and our working capital metrics continue to improve. We expect to continue into Q4 at this time based on what we know. And that's where we are looking based on the recovery of all of our working capital, as well as higher sales that you've seen in Q2 and Q3. So that's all I need to know on that front. Now, Alibaba, I'll read this real quick. Um, no change in our outlook since last week's commentary or the week before. You can listen to those or read the articles on the website. The business continues to improve and generate more free cash flow, 27% year-on-year growth, 28.1 billion free cash flow in the trailing 12 months, if you add the four quarters together, 21.8% free cash flow yield. We did that calculation yesterday, uh, last week for you and higher sales up 9% year on year. The price of the stock does not reflect that until it does. There are 60 to $70 billion of non-core assets, everything that's not Taobao, Tmall, AliCloud, or AIDC, which is the international AliExpress uh, uh, and Lazada type business, the international e-commerce business. 
we can expect that will all be monetized, sold, spun, uh, IPO'd, et cetera. Uh, add the $60 billion of additional net cash on the balance sheet, it's a little more than that, plus the 28.1 uh, trailing 12 months free cash flow generation growing prospectively, and they'll have enough cash to buy in 100% of the float if they want. Now, if you don't know what that means, let me put it this way. If you own an apartment building with 10 partners and the cash that the asset generates is used to buy out the other nine partners' equity without you having to put more of your own cash into the investment, over time, you are the only partner or shareholder left receiving the benefits of the asset or cash flow if you are the patient partner who, who refuses to sell. Uh, in the case of what that means in terms of a public company stock, it means that uh, the less shareholders they are, are uh, even if the cash flow doesn't grow, the stock price goes a lot higher. There's a whole bunch of noise circulating around how the SoftBank prepaid forward contracts are responsible for the price being, quote, held down. What I can tell you from being in this business for many years is this. When price moves against someone, it's always due to some mysterious quote, manipulation and never due to being early or wrong. Um, there's, it's unequivocal we were early on this investment. That's the understatement of the year. But with no leverage, it doesn't matter because it's the process that matters, not the timing. You can only control the process. You know, Rolls Royce was a triple in less than a year or just over a year. Uh, Cooper Standard, same thing. Intel, double. Uh, COVID, uh, the Wells Fargo was a double, Exxon was a double. I mean, you know, some of these things happen in six or 12 months, so, you know, some of them take years. So, um, all right, so the, and uh, yeah, so when it moves against you, it's always some mysterious manipulation. When the price moves, and by the way, all this about the SoftBank, I looked at all the mechanics and all their disclosure, and there's probably some truth to that in the short term, but, um, What the conspiracy theorists don't account for is if that's true, it's a double-edged sword. So why was the stock price able to move from $58 to $120 after these prepaid forwards were in place from December through January uh, 2022 to 2023 when the same mysterious forces were holding the stock down? Well, they weren't able to contain a 100% move. Um, and I, I think that, um, and by the way, these things all roll off uh, in January and April and then some in June, but you're focused on the wrong things, you know, and, and the alternative is also true. When the price moves with you, uh, so when it moves against you, it's someone else manipulating the price. And when it moves with you, it's always our brilliance that caused it. We were so smart. We knew the exact tick that it was going to turn and based on this and that. It's, you know, the only thing you can control is your process, not the timing. We have some multi-baggers hit fair value in months and some take years. Traders say it's wrong or early, which is why there are very few of them on the Forbes 400. Good things come to those who wait, not those who whine. Let me state this clearly from the masters, Ben Graham and Warren Buffett. In the short term, the market is a voting machine based on emotions. In the long term, it's a weighing machine based on fundamentals. You know, you see all these people on Twitter going crazy and coming up with all these theories and Elliott Wave bullshit that doesn't work. Uh, at the end of the day, um, whether it's tax law selling, SoftBank, Jack Ma selling, Elliott Wave silliness causing the price to move down, it's nonsense. Price is what you pay. Value is what you get. Focus on what do you get is the is the business generating more free cash flow today than it was last year when it traded in the 60s or 70s and in 2015 when it traded in the 60s or 70s <laughs> you know it's generating five or six times more cash flow per share uh are the free cash flow and revenues growing or contracting well it's you know you're getting about eight times as much revenue per share as you were in 2015 so all of these things are key. And then finally, is the multiple or the yield on that cash flow above your expected rate of return? And is it trading above or below its historic range 
uh, and that of comparables. So if, you know, Alibaba's traded, I think, at an average multiple of 22 or 23 times since inception. I think it's trading at seven right now, seven or eight, depending on what you look at. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> even if it, and by the way, if it was trading at an average, that means it spent a meaningful time above 22 times. So let's say the business didn't grow and we just normalized to normal multiples, the kind of stock. So anyway, I mean, we've been through this over and over. It, it'll matter when it does. And when Morgan Stanley finally upgrades and puts a $300 price target on uh, or 350, that's when we'll have a different view. So um, in the meantime, we're bullish. So, um, okay, so above or below is historic range of that of comps. Everything else is a complete waste of time. You guys are focused on things that don't matter because you're impatient. So we'll tech, and I'm saying you generally, I think most of this audience is actually um, uh, knows this stuff because you're already very wealthy or uh, you didn't know this stuff and you've learned it and now you know it and you're becoming very wealthy. So that's that's all a good thing. So will tax law selling SoftBank, Jack Ma selling or Elliott Wave or any other nonsense narrative impact the company's ability to continue to grow? The answer is no. It may impact price at the margin for a short period of time. But in the long term, the weighing machine will kick in and slingshot the price back to a level appropriate to its intrinsic value. Current, and, and that's defined in, our, in my world, the Tom, turnaround Tom's definition, which is current and future ability to generate cash discounted back by the risk-free rate over the time period and adjusted for the shares remaining outstanding. So right now, the price is detached from the intrinsic value, but a beach ball can only be held underwater for so long. This does remind me a lot of the Archegos blow up when um, you had this guy buying unnatural amounts of uh, options to create a gamma squeeze in some of the uh, dog stocks like Paramount and Warner Brothers, which now are no longer uh, dog stocks, they're starting to get a bid, but and they drove up the price abnormally high because the dealers were caught on the wrong side. These are the same dealers that, uh, and by the way, eventually it collapsed. So his game played out and now he's you know trying not to go to jail or he may have gone to jail or whatever, because he kind of allegedly didn't tell the different dealers that uh, he was already um, uh, had other counterparties. So he pledged the same assets across many different dealers across the street, uh, which is kind of comical that there were no checks and balances for that, but um, oh, tragically comical. Um, so this whole structural phenomenon with SoftBank's prepaid forward contracts and the dealers holding the price down uh, or, or SoftBank needing the price to be at a certain level, uh, you, number one, you overestimate their, the amount of powder they have to impact price, particularly for such a large business. And number two, sooner or later, the dam breaks. And the same forces that were, quote, mysteriously holding the price down will have margin calls and will get caught naked. And that will exacerbate the price move twice as fast as it wouldn't be had that structural positioning not been in place and it was just a natural market. So uh, when I hear all these conspiracy theories, it just makes me more excited. It's, it's only a question, if it was a natural market, it would be a linear move back to intrinsic value. But when there, there are structural, potential structural headwinds that everyone's focused on, which is nonsense in my world because the cash flow is still growing and the revenues are still growing and there are a lot of outs and there's a lot of uh, huge amounts of uh, growth that are going to happen. It just takes it from a linear progression to what will be a binary progression and a quantum growth, uh, quantum jump when the um, when the dam breaks. So uh, I love it. If there if if all of the fear about this manipulation and holding the price at a level for SoftBank is true, then um, when it breaks, it's going to be like, you know, 50 and 100 point moves. Um, but 
I don't really care about that or count on that or care when the dam breaks or when the contracts unwind or anything else because the underlying business is, is growing and I own a larger and larger share every single month as they buy back more stock. And they're going to buy back another 13 billion in the next year. So that's a good thing, not a bad thing. I'll own 5% more of the company without doing, I'll have a 5% increase in positioning without doing, well, actually 13 billion. Now the market cap's so low. I'll, I'll, my position will grow by 7% without putting any additional capital in. I put a ton of additional capital in in the last week. Uh, so that's exciting too. So there you go. Um, all right. So right now the price is detached from intrinsic value, but a beach ball can only be held underwater for so long. Eventually physics takes over. Certain laws are immutable. If you don't believe in or trust physics and math, you should sell the stocks with the other traders. Uh, that may be right for the next few ticks or the next few quote candlesticks. But if you get got into it for a few dollar move one way or another, you're wasting your time. There is no remedy for not doing your own homework and understanding what you own. Emotions will always beat lazy, uninformed traders sooner or later. They do not deter hardworking, informed, sensible investors who have done the work and know what they own. Now, on to the short-term market for <laughs> short-term view for the general market. Sentiment is elevated. Uh, investors are getting giddy, which is why the market has kind of been churning around. Uh, usually first two weeks of December are flat, followed by the Santa rally. We'll see. These, these can stay elevated, though. 47 seems high, but if you go back a few years, that's normal in the beginning stages of multi-year rallies. Um, fear and greed, 63. It's kind of mid to a little bit giddy. And then the uh, National Association of Active Investment Managers at 80. 100 is when it gets a little uh, exuberant. So I think there's some juice into the end of the year. Earnings for REITs. Revised down uh, for next year by 5.46 and down by 79 basis points. Most of these things are down 80%, so that's amply priced in, although Vernado's uh, almost doubled, uh, which is pretty exciting. I think it got up to $27 this week, and what were we on claim and talking, at, talking about it when it was at 15 and on our podcast between 13 and 16. So um, it's so funny. All these doubles that have happened – all anyone thinks about is Alibaba, which is just like, you know, this is, uh, anyway, it's just comical. It's been an unbelievably good year. Uh, and all we're focused on is, uh, so that's funny. But uh, all right, utilities, um, plus 50 basis points uh, in the last 60 days for 2023, uh, negative uh, 0.24. Uh, for next year, so they're flat, they're down. That's an opportunity as uh, rates go, uh, as rates have come down. All right, let's do some Ask Me Anything questions, and then I got to run to Boston to uh, see my kids compete. Zivko Kanazirski, uh, UI Path. Uh, we we covered this a couple weeks ago. Um, let me just pull it up. Ubiqu oh, UI path. UI. Oh no, wait. Yeah, ubiquity networks. Um yeah, I thought the financials looked good, but um oh, I gotta make this smaller so we can get all the numbers in here. Okay, so by the way, the podcast is over. Anyone that wants to stick around for um, ask me anything questions, please do. So revenues have been growing. Cash from operations have turned negative, gone from positive 600 to negative 119. Uh, explains uh, cash from financing. Cash from free cash flow negative. Uh, so this is not the type of stuff I like to see. I don't like negative free cash flow um, unless I have a clear reason why it's going to inflect back. Um, 
Yeah, I think I understand why you're looking at it. It's down 66%. Um, I'll have to take a closer look. I, I don't understand this business as well as I need to, to make an informed decision, networking technology for service providers. You know, this is tech. You, you have to understand, like, are they losing or gaining share? I, I'm going to pass Zipco. You might be right on this, but um, I don't have enough information right now. I'm not going to do two hours for an AMA question. Um, but I, I think you might be on the right track, but you just have to understand what's their plan to get an inflection and are they losing or gaining share? you got to solve those two problems. Look at their uh, comparables and find out who's eating their lunch or is the whole group rolled over. And if that's the case, then um, you may have something. Tila Tap. Uh, Peel Hunt, it's a UK stock. Let's see. Peel, Peel Hunt Limited, what do they do? Tiny company, investment bank in the UK. I, I don't like investment banks, uh, especially small ones. They have no scale and they're just at the whim of the cycle um, and i don't like bankers running businesses because they tend to uh extract value versus deliver value it's just their nature um and that sounds harsh but just find the counter find me an example where that's not true um i've never seen anyone get rich in investment banking stock uh, that didn't have a well-rounded business around it. But let's take a look at the numbers and be open-minded. Revenues have cut in half. That's because of the M&A cycle. These companies shouldn't be public is really what it comes down to. They should be private partnerships like Goldman was for years and years. Um, and just distribute the profits to the owners. I mean, that that's... The best case once the incentives aren't fully aligned the uh the outcomes are different so uh no this is a no for me i look i think that it's going to catch a tailwind from the banking cycle but there are better ways to play it i mean just by you know city's up now 20 percent um we own city and bank of america just play it with a quality business versus a little cyclical garbage business where you're betting on you know eight partners and how much business they're going to bring in when they're competing against goldman sachs um ridwan muzaki i'd like to know your thoughts on baidu's business prospects um robo taxi business that's that's nonsense uh what are your thoughts on this pe of 14 i i don't i don't think i've ever even looked at pe talking about businesses on this podcast before that's like laziness. You have to, not, I'm not talking to you now. I, I'm glad that you presented the, uh, look, I think Baidu is a good business. It's the um, Google of China uh, and it's trading like every other stock in China, whether it's Alibaba, JD, Tencent or Alibaba. When China starts to work, this stock will work and it probably goes from 115 to 250. Um, let's just see here. But I don't like this business. There's not as a much, uh, there's not as many outs. And um, let's just take a look at their growth here. See if I can do it in US dollars. So yeah, this is why I don't like this business. Their revenues have basically been the same since 2015. Um, it's trading like a utility. And uh, so their multiples probably compressed and that will re-rate when the uh, flows come back into China. But you know, even their flat free cash flow hasn't grown. So it's not even a pandemic issue with them. It's just their business is like a, it's like a utility that's not growing. So I would just say, yeah, you'll probably get a double when flows come back into China, but there's so many better places. Like I can think of one 
<laughs> off the top of my head, that's a better opportunity. Aaron Hawks Hollery, uh, what do you think of Palantir? Uh, this is not the type of stock that I traffic in. Uh, buddy of mine always talks about it on um, Fox. Um, let's see here. So the revenues keep growing. It's decelerated a little bit, but they're still growing. Um, let's see if they're generating cash flow. This is not really a cash flow story. This is a guess the future story. So they've got 474 million of free cash flow. Uh, I'm gonna say that um, This is a speculation on AI. So I mean the stock went down 90% or 85%. Now it's rebounded. It's a four bagger in a few months. I, I mean uh, this goes in my too hard pile because I don't really understand this business and I haven't seen it operate through a lot of cycles. So this is like SoFi. They're like cult stocks. People just can't get enough of it. Just go with like more boring things that you can predictably and confidently know what's going to happen in the future versus new things. I mean, you can put these high flyer speculative stocks in a small portion of your portfolio and maybe make a hundred times your money. But um, I'd rather just keep making doubles and triples and Rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat pr with predictability, compound the money. Um, so uh, I don't have a good a good uh, answer for you on that. It's not what I do. Justin Montana, uh, what do you think about Hasbro? I looked at this one. These things are not good quality businesses, but there are basically two, Hasbro and Mattel. Uh, it's dropped 55%. This thing always seems to bounce back over time. Uh, I think you're gonna probably do okay with it here. Let's just take a look at the numbers. Um, so it's been hurting a little bit since uh, the pandemic. Uh, their top line, it's not really doing much. You know, peaked at 6.5 two years ago. It's now at 5.3. It was at 5.3 back in 2017. Uh, so again, this is another business running like a utility, but it's gone down enough that you probably get a bounce up to 75. I think there are just better things to do with your money. Uh, Mohammed Otab, but it will probably work. Mohammed Otabi, uh, any thoughts on gold? No, uh, we only deal with productive assets that... Um, um, generate cash, uh, gold, Bitcoin, all that stuff is just the greater fool theory. And uh, based on a narrative of the moment, is there going to be money printing? Is there going to be inflation? Is there going to be war? Like, who cares? Like, you got to consult your psychic to see if it's going to go up. If there's going to be inflation, you buy businesses that have pricing power and generate more cash. If there's going to be war, you buy defensive stocks. If there's going to be um, it's just not for me. Look, that said, people have made billions with Bitcoin. I missed it. So it works until it doesn't or it works forever and I just miss it. And I'm perfectly comfortable with errors of omission because for everything that has all of the features of what Bitcoin represents, 999 out of a thousand times, it's going to be a scam and you're going to lose all your money. So one in a thousand time it worked and it worked big. So kudos for those who bought at two cents and now have it at $40,000. I mean, um brilliant kudos but you can only eat so many cheeseburgers in a lifetime so uh there you go uh never risk what you have and need for something that you want and don't need uh, i think buffett put it that way and it's just like you know how many houses do you need like you don't have to do um unbelievable feats to make a lot of money in life. You just do simple, predictable things over and over and over. 
and you'll have more than you could possibly want. So maybe you can't fly, fly uh, own your own plane, you can fly private whenever you want and you choose not to, or you choose to do it, you do whatever you wanna do, but it's like, it's not worth risking it on things that have a high probability of failure where you could lose it all versus you know owning eight or 12 great businesses that have a high predictability that are probably gonna be doubles or triples and in some cases a lot more uh and you know eight work and they they're multi-baggers to fail you know shit happens excuse me shit happens uh but on balance over time you're compounding above average and and um you got everything you want have you ever heard of an activist investor being in a china stock waste of time just like japan that's where all the value investors got trapped in japan for years because they thought they were going to move these family companies into you know extracting value it never happened it's a cultural thing it's a legal thing you're not going to do it you buy it because it's a good business and you wait for the cycle to change um doesn't work in china alan woolman uh came across e h t h lately all right e h t h Okay, let's take a look. Okay. Bad business and a bad e health. Okay, just a website. Stock was decimated, new management, uh, and nine. Uh, competitive landscape, uh, favorable demographic. Um, all right, so revenues are down from yeah, their pre-pandemic and pandemic peak of a half a billion down to 356. Earnings per share is negative. Cash flow. just turning positive so there's some hope for inflection balance sheet look like they've got some cash not much debt uh i just you know I mean, it's priced in some really bad news. They're not going bankrupt. So I just think I need to understand because the revenues keep declining, what's gonna turn this around? So you gotta listen to eight calls, understand new management's new plan. Why does the world need e-health? I've never heard of it, but, um, and what's the competition? And if there's some clear, plausible plan to stop the bleeding and have the revenues turn around, then you could probably get a multi-bagger. Um, but I haven't done the work on that, but I think it's um, uh, something worth exploring. Uh, thank you for submitting that. Michael Tan, uh, can you comment on the recent Moody's downgrade of China? Um, uh, we covered that already, Michael. Thanks for the uh, thing. They usually mark the lows. <laughs> Sam R, notice a lot of US data is being revised by quite a big margin. I think I know why Buffett don't really care about these figures, only individual business numbers. Do you care much about these numbers? No, I only really care in terms of how they impact what the Fed's going to do because the Fed impacts the cost of capital, which impacts the value I assign to a business. Beyond that, it's all a bunch of noise. Kayla Smith, uh, what is your general opinion on the shipping industry? Uh, they manage to lose money 99% of the time, regardless of conditions, and 1% of the time, they become massive multi-baggers. Um, they usually run up too much debt and then they collapse. Um, SBLK. Uh, Frontline is probably best in class here. Safe bulkers. So these things look like they're starting to turn. Um, they've run a lot. I mean, these are up 10x. I... If, if you put a gun to my head and said, pick a shipper, I'd probably buy Frontline, but it's already moved. So um, I'd probably buy Frontline and stick with it, but these, I don't think right now is the perfect time. 
Uh, PE is not the right way to look at businesses. Um, Paul Hauck, do you think about orthopediatrics kids? I work as medical device sales. Seem to be picking up a lot of share. They're down 30% for the year. K-I-D-S. Okay. This is medical devices. It probably got <laughs> sold off because of GLP-1s, which has nothing to do with pediatric devices, but everything is sold off for no reason. Okay. Uh, anatomically appropriately implants and devices for treatment of orthopedic conditions. Okay. And sold off with the GLP-1. So this revenue is just going straight up, except for the pandemic year when no one went to the dent doctor's offices. Uh, are they generating any cash? No. Free cash flow negative. So then you got to worry about the balance sheet. They used to have 70 million in cash. They now have 10. Uh, how much debt do they have? Not much. Hmm. This doesn't look like a great quality business though. Ah. This is a trade, not a business. I think you're right, Paul, but uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't risk capital personally because they're losing money. Uh, if you know the business very well and it's evident they have some blockbuster product that's going to keep having legs and you've done your research and listened to a bunch of the conference calls and read the public filings, then maybe you want to own it as a business. Uh, I think it's I think it's good that you flagged it. It's not a good enough business for me to put capital into, but I can see it certainly working as a trade back to 50 just based on doing two minutes. If I did real work and I understood the share and the product and all that stuff, I might have a different view, but uh, that's where I come out now. Donald Williams, uh, thanks for all you do. Historically speaking, the effects of the Fed action shouldn't show up for nine to 12 months. No stock market stuff that I know I've ever finished before the pivot. Is this cycle just playing out the same or is this time different? If it's different, why is it different? It's not different. It's just like 1981 and 1982. Go look at that one. Problem with everyone right now, Donald, is they're all looking at the last three cycles, 2000, 2008, et cetera, and they're getting fooled by recency bias. Go look at the comparable situation the last time the Fed tightened this much, and you'll see two inversions, 80 and 82, and the market took off and never looked back. And that's what everyone's missing, is they're looking at all the indicators that gave them 100% certainty in the last 20 years, and they're missing that conditions have completely changed and they need to look at a set of conditions and timings that was comparable. And I think the best comparability was either the 95 cycle or the 81, 82 cycle. So um, stay off Twitter, unless you're following at Hedge Fund Tips and uh, hang in there. <laughs> Sam R, could you explain what you mean by Baba monetizing core assets? We talked about that, sell spin. IPO, Kyler Johnson, just wanted to say, I appreciate the knowledge you're willing to share. Time you put into these for us. My question, what are some good ways to get relevant experience in the future to get a job at a fund? 23, aspire one day to run a fund, but have found it difficult to do anything more than spend lots of time learning on my own. Any thoughts are appreciated. Uh, I did a video on this like a year ago. Google it. Uh, head fund, uh, Tom Hayes, University of Bristol's Women in Finance Society interview. Uh, two years ago, just play that. I give all the tips of what you need to do if you want to get into this business. Um, next is Ron. And by the way, thank you for uh, saying how this helped you. That means a lot to me. And I'm grateful that you all tune in every week. Ron Amchin, what do you think of the competitive threats that Pinduoduo opposes to Alibaba? We covered it. I think they're more limited than you think. And I think they don't really have an edge. I think they just kind of did something new in a market that Alibaba wasn't really in. Uh, and now that they've put everyone on alert that has tons of cash, resources, experience, and twice as good AI, uh, they're, gonna, they're coming for them. Henrik Schoendouble, uh, UAL. Okay. UAL. 
I, you know, I'm looking at all these airlines. They, they look cheap. So it's just going to be a question of, um, you're probably better off buying jets just by the ETF because one of them is going to go bankrupt from an over leveraged balance sheet and you can get the same juice with jets, um, by the ETF and call it a day. They're cheap. They're all over leveraged rates are coming down. So they'll probably be able to refinance. Uh, fuel prices have come down lately. That's a good thing. Travel, I think uh, discretionary travel may be softening a little bit with the consumer business travels going up, international travels going up. I like the story. I just wouldn't put all my eggs in one basket for that group because it's such a kind of like a, it's the same way we think about biotech. Uh, that's why we like XBI and continue to like XBI. So with that said, I want to thank everyone for tuning in this week. We'll be back next week, same time, same place. In the meantime, make it a great one. Bye for now.